So uh, we're going to talk about um, benefit risk today. And again, as I mentioned, from a practical perspective, right? a practical approach. Because this exercise proves to be quite difficult in practice. And the guidance that's available out there is sort of limited in scope. It doesn't give you a lot of examples. So what I have done here in this presentation is I want to share with you some case studies that I have compiled based on publicly available data. I don't have any inside information. So all publicly available data and uh, FDA guidance documents, which is also a public document. And some of my personal experience as well, I will share with you. So to emphasize again, this is not a compliance versus non-compliance discussion. This is more about sharing practical tips. So let's keep the big picture in mind. I always start with the big picture. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing benefit risk evaluation? It relates directly to the question of safe and effective. So what is safe and effective? It's actually a regulatory requirement. And if you read FDA's guidance documents and the regulation, this is what you will learn. Medical devices are expected to provide a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness by weighing the probable benefits against probable risk of injury or illness from such use. So it's a weighing exercise, which, which means we are basically making a judgment. Judgment based on data, observations, subject matter opinion, clinical experience. A lot goes into evaluating a device for safety and effectiveness. With the case study examples that I will share with you today, maybe it will help us to clarify our understanding of what might be involved. It's not a perfect science. So how does FDA evaluate safety and effectiveness? Safe is when probable benefits to the health outweigh any probable risks. Note the keyword probable. This is not hypothetical. This is not just possible. This is not hand-waving. We have to show data and evidence, and we have to consider probable benefits versus probable risks. So what's about effectiveness? Because it's both. Effective is that significant portion of the target population experiences clinically significant results. So when we talk about benefits, they are tied to the effectiveness as well. And it's the balance between those benefits and the risk that we are, we are evaluating to judge safety and effectiveness. To note again, FDA expects valid scientific evidence and reasonable assurance. And that reasonable term indicates that there is a judgment involved here. What's reasonable? So it depends. Another key concept to understand is that benefit risk is not a static or an absolute measure. It is a relative measure. It depends on what else is out there. So if you look at it in a very simple way, uh, let's talk about relative benefit. Relative benefit could be low or high. Now the question is relative to what? relative to what else might be out there that is providing the same therapeutic benefit that you are trying to provide with your medical device. If there is none, that means you, every benefit you provide is all relative benefit. Now, on the other hand, I look at tolerable risk. How much can we tolerate? Right? It could be low or high. Now, you have certain scenarios. The first scenario I call incremental solution. Incremental solution doesn't mean uh, sort of lower level technology. It could be high tech, but it could be an incremental solution over what else is out there already. On the other hand, maybe we have a very innovative solution to a tough medical problem. And again, it may not be always the highest or the most sophisticated technology, but maybe we are trying to solve a very tough problem. In that, a higher relative benefit would be expected and a higher tolerable risk might be okay. But here's the deal, it's not a point in time. It's not, a, it's not a point on a chart because there's a lot of uncertainty involved on both ends. The key point is, is that a higher level of uncertainty might be tolerable in the benefit risk if the solution is highly innovative to a tough medical problem. So there's a lot of relative kind of conversations going on here that inf inform our judgment. So we are not making a random judgment, but we are keeping all these factors in mind. Okay, so let's quickly review the requirements because even though we talk about this not being a compliance versus non-compliance discussion, we need to understand what the requirements are from a 14971 point of view. So in clause 7.4, there's a requirement for benefit risk analysis where if a residual risk is not judged acceptable using the criteria established in the risk management plan 
and further risk control is not practicable, the manufacturer may gather and review data and literature to determine if the benefits of the intended use outweigh this residual risk. Now this is sort of optional because they use the word may. You may need to do it when an individual residual risk is still not acceptable based on your predefined criteria and no further risk reduction is practicable. Right? So it depends. You can choose to do benefit risk, risk analysis for a residual risk. But the real thing that we want to talk about today is in Clause 8, which is evaluation of overall residual risk. So this is after all risk control measures have been implemented and verified, the manufacturer shall evaluate the overall residual risk posed by the medical device, taking into account the contribution of all residual risks in relation to the benefits of the intended use, using the method and the criteria for acceptability of the overall residual risk defined in the risk management plan. So we have to define the method and the criteria of the overall residual risk evaluation in the risk management plan. And we also have to define the criteria for individual residual risk evaluation, both. So these are two different things. For individual residual risk, you apply clause 7.4 if you need to. But for clause 8, you must do benefit risk evaluation for the overall residual risk because that relates directly to the safety and effectiveness. And in clause 9, when we do risk management review, we can't move forward until we can say that the overall residual risk is acceptable in the context of the benefits of intended use. So this is the framework of sort of requirements of 14971, which relates directly to the question of safety and effectiveness. So today we're going to focus mostly on clause 8 and uh, discuss the regulatory perspective and maybe some examples. So I'm going to share with you some couple of insights from case studies and I'm going to share three examples. The first one is a robotic surgical system, Senhance. It's a robotic assisted surgery for gynecological and colorectal laparoscopic procedures. And here the sponsor has used real world data to generate evidence for safety and effectiveness. Early point system is a diagnostic aid based on analyzing eye movement to assist clinicians in diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder. And here, they are leveraging a predicate device classified through de novo, and they are narrowing the scope of intended use and indication. And finally, it's a lung fit pH system which provides inhaled nitric oxide therapy to improve oxygenation to reduce the need for ECMO for infants on ventilator due to acute respiratory failure. So it's a pretty uh, sort of high risk situation where we would expect to see a little bit higher tolerance because the benefit is also high. In this case, they are using extensive non-clinical testing to reduce uncertainty in the risk due to device performance and human factors. And they are relying on other published clinical studies to make a case for safety and effectiveness. So let's look at very briefly, again, one by one, we'll go into this and highlight a few points.